Well, I guess I have the uh, the honor to be the first to hold the talk in English today. So um, yeah, bear with me. Um, but yeah, uh, working with Kafka for the last four or five years in Satnet, uh, I come from J Professionals. Uh, by the way, how many of you are using Kafka in production today? Okay, so about half of those who are not sleeping. Um, uh, cool. Um, yeah, so. I want to cover the things that we have experienced, we have seen, and also things we've, we've kind of, we're on the way to make those mistakes, but we've discovered them early enough. So let's start with compression. Uh, there's nothing wrong in the compression itself. It's used to make your messages smaller on the wire when you're sending them over. Usually that helps with throughput because you're sending more megabytes or gigabytes in the unit of time. And there are multiple compression algorithms you can use. Um, and um, there's there's always kind of a, a play between how much CPU it uses versus how much compression it gives you. Um, and compression is is usually recommended, especially if you're you're using like a text-based uh, messages like JSON or XML. Uh, but the things that we've kind of seen often people ask is like, can we use compression for large messages? Because Kafka usually sets a threshold of around one megabyte by default on the messages. So for people who want to send like five, 10 megabyte messages, like should we use compression? We see that we, when we compress it, it goes to like 100K. So it's fine, yes? Well, it depends. If your size is consistent of the messages that you're sending, then yeah, sure, you're fine. But be wary that after like three months in production, you can get a message that all of a sudden will not compress and will not go through. So you will end up having basically a poison message. Your producer will be sitting there trying to write to Kafka, but you won't be able to because both the producer and the Kafka will re reject the message because it's too big. So what do you do in that case? Well, you can ask the operations team to increase the limit on Kafka, which they probably won't be happy with because it affects the memory on the brokers. Uh, the other option is to use the external storage. So you take your payload, upload it to like S3 or whatever you have, and then instead of sending the, the payload in Kafka, you just send the reference to the actual message. And the third option is recommended only if you control both the producer and consumer, so both ends, which is chunking, so your producer would slice the messages in smaller batch, uh, smaller groups, um, whether uh, logically or, or by size, and then your consumer has to assemble them and make sense of them, so make the original message back. Um, the next thing are metrics. So there are Kafka libraries, both Java and others, expose a lot of metrics, and you should get to know them well because there's, a, and you should collect them, of course, uh, because there's a lot of knowledge to be gained uh, from there. Um, so for example, producer gives you the, the average request latency, which is the time from the moment you call a send until it gets the acknowledgement back. Um, you get a retry rate, error rates, a lot of, lot of metrics slide in there. For the consumer, one of the most useful is the lag. So that is how far behind the producer your consumer actually is. So if you see that number increasing, that means there's something, either something wrong with your consumer or it's not able to handle the load that is coming. So you either need to spin up more consumers or you need to talk to the producers and ask them to slow down. So the, um, the reason I've, I've mentioned metrics is because of client optimization. So there is, by default, Kafka is optimized usually for, for latency, but different teams have different requirements. And in order to, to optimize your, your client, uh, to optimize your, your Kafka, um, there are many, many knobs you can turn. So in order to do that properly, the first thing you need to know is what you're optimizing for, right? Um, then you need to understand what are defaults in the cluster, because when the operations team has set the cluster, they have, they have set certain defaults based on what they thought is the most, most uh, usual um, use case. Uh, and then you need to start measuring your baseline. So where are you now? That's where the metrics come in. Check your metrics, and then you start turning the knobs and see in which directions you're moving. Are you going towards the latency you, want, you need? Are you going towards durability and so on and so forth? Um, so 
why I, why I said that you need to know what you're optimizing for, because there are many ways you can optimize your Kafka producers and consumers, and they are affecting the way the way the, the, the Kafka behaves and the, the, the results you get. So for example, if you're optimizing for throughput, so you try to send as many uh, <coughs> sorry as, as, as many messages as possible in the unit of time, that will affect your latency because the way Kafka does that, it's batching messages on the producer and tries to send them in one big, big batch because the uh, the network traffic is the most expensive one. So that directly affects the latency. And latency is you want your message to get from the producer to the consumer as fast as possible. So I won't go through all of this because uh, it just explains in details uh, what, what the availability and the durability and all the different things are. But just to cover a few things. So for example, when it comes to availability, that means that your your uh, both producers and consumers need to recover as fast as possible. They need, need to be available as fast as possible. And what can happen, for example, on the consumer side, the consumer is basi basically an endless loop, constantly polling for messages. And once it gets the messages, uh, it starts uh, processing them. And during that processing, your processing might be too slow because you're talking to an external system, for example, or you have a garbage collection pause that is happening. And if, if there is a, a pause and your consumer doesn't report fast enough to the rest of the group, it will be thrown out of the consumer group. So we'll get this, this balance. So things like network partition might affect that. Your garbage collection, as I mentioned, might affect those things. So if you're, if you're optimizing for availability, you might need to increase your heartbeat timeout or your poll timeout in that case. Um, for throughput, as I mentioned, you want to send as many messages as possible in the unit of time. So you want to increase the batch size, so as many messages in one go. You want to use compression. And um, on the consumer side, the same thing. You want to you wanna fetch as many messages as possible in one go, so to have least chat over the network, because that's the most expensive thing. Uh, the, uh, when it comes to producer and acknowledgement, yeah. Um, the producer can be configured with multiple ways, whether to wait the acknowledgement from the brokers before it continues writing, or it can just keep on sending messages no matter what. And that's what the ax all or one or zero is for. So what ax all means is that the producer will send a message to the broker it's talking to, and then it will wait for other brokers to replicate this message. And um, if, for example, your, your producer is expecting that there are minimum three brokers that replicate the data, but one broker is down, the producer will basically sit there and wait for the broker to come up. And that is, that is uh, affecting your availability, for example. But on the other hand, if you're optimizing for durability, which means your messages are sacred, you always need to store them in Kafka, in that case, you don't want to write if there's only one broker available, because if you write a message and that broker goes down, you have literally lost your, your data. So in case of durability, you want to have high replication on your topics. You want to have minimum two in-sync replicas, which means you want at least two brokers to replicate your data before the producer continues writing. And ideally, you want to use idempotence, means um, that, that the message, even if you send duplicate messages, Kafka will handle them. And on the consumer side, you want to disable auto commit. So consumer um, commits the offset. Uh, by default, it commits it automatically, which means every few seconds. And you usually don't want that. You want to commit your offset only after you have completely processed the message. And not just one message, but the entire batch you have fetched from the brokers. And um, yeah, one, one more thing that's, that's a possibility is if you have an external system that your consumer is writing into, like a database or something that, that supports transactions, there's an option to consider saving your offset into the external system because then you, you can do it in one transaction instead of writing into database and then committing your offset into Kafka. So the main, the main thing that I want to cover here is that 
with, with the same parameters, you can kind of get very different results from your Kafka clients. So for example, for latency, um, as I said, the, the client might be, conf or the producer might be configured with X all, which means it will wait for all the brokers to replicate the data. But if latency is your, the thing that you're, you're really uh, concerned with, you want to reduce that. So you want maybe only one broker to report back and say, I'm fine, send the data more. Or if you don't care if the data is, is relatively cheap, maybe you're just gathering like user clicks on the website and you don't care if you lose message here and there, you might go with X all, which means your producer is not waiting on any, on any confirmation, just keeps on sending as long as it, <coughs> sorry, as long as it has contact to the broker. Um, and when it comes to the uh, to the both producer and the consumer, when the latency is concerned, you want to send small small batches so so that the message is sent as fast as possible, which again affects your throughput. And um, when it comes to Kafka streams, there are by default initially when they when they wrote the, the Kafka streams library. They, they didn't, I don't think they've, they've covered this because this came as a, as a later uh, implementation. They, they didn't allow you to, to name your, your nodes in a topology. And what that, what, that drive, what that leads to is, by default, when you look at your topology, let's look at an example. On the left-hand side, you have a, like a default topology that is doing some processing. So you can see that you have a, a source, you're reading data from a topic, then you're doing some filtering based on the name here. You don't know what exactly you're doing. And then you're doing some mapping of the values and then you're sending the output to Kafka. So it's, if you try to debug something like this, it's extremely difficult to understand what's going on. So now it's possible, now for, for, for a few years already, it's possible to give the names to every node in your topology. And that will give you the, the thing on the right hand side, which is much more readable. So you know you're, you're getting the customer transactions and then you're filtering out the invalid ones. And then you're, you're doing some mapping and writing things out. So if you're do, doing debugging or God forbid, doing something at 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning, uh, this, will, this will help you much more. So that's the first thing, the naming the nodes gives you readability, but it also gives you something much more important and that's if you have stateful operations in your Kafka streams, it will help you to, or yeah, it will help you not lose the state by accident once you're rolling out a new, new version. And here's how that can happen. So here's a simple code. It just reads from the input topic, groups the messages by key, the, the top part, and then it counts how many messages are per key and sends it out to the output topic. And that is the version one of our application. And let's say, let's say later, later on somebody comes along and says, look, we're not interested in all the messages. Let's just the ones that are, in this case, longer than, than six characters. Let's just do those. So let's see how the, <coughs> the topology looks if, um, if you don't name them. So the left-hand side is the version one. We're reading from the topic, we're aggregating, and here comes the stateful part. Kafka stores the state in two locations. One is the local state because it needs it very, very close by so it can work fast. But it also needs to back that data somewhere in case the application restarts or loses the local storage. So the way it's backed, it's backed by the internal topic called change log topic. And the, the topic itself gets the name from the node. So if your node is called state store 01, your topic will be named Kafka something 01 change log. And let's say we have the, uh, let's go back to the, to the previous slide. So here we have the, the filtering added in version two. That has basically added a new node here. And if you take a look, the numbers have changed and so has your state store the name of the state store has changed because that's what Kafka is using by default to generate these names. So now Kafka streams will, this one will start up. It will look at the, uh, look for the, for the internal topic called 002 and it won't find it in Kafka and it will help happily create it for you 
completely empty. So all the data that, that lies in the previous topic, the changelog topic, is now gone. So you can lose state in that case. So, but if you go for the approach of naming things, you get to control how the state store is called, and then that state store gets reflected into the internal topic name as well. Yeah, um, I'm guessing the uh, the slides will be available, so I've I've added the links here to all the all the things I've been talking about. So, uh, yeah, because I I didn't want to bother you with all the details, but. Yeah, take a look at the resource and um, that's all I wanted to talk about.